So now turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6 as we continue our study in perhaps the most famous sermon of all time, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. We've looked at chapter 5, the first four verses of chapter 6, and now this morning we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 8 in a message that I'm entitling, The Spirit of Prayer. The Spirit of Prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this time, for your grace and your mercy. And Heavenly Father, we know that you know exactly what we need. And Heavenly Father, all of the people who are listening and watching, Lord, you know exactly what they need. Lord, you know who needs assurance and you know who needs forgiveness. Lord, you know who needs help right now. Lord, you know who needs healing. Lord, you know whose marriage is in trouble and whose children have, have gone astray. Lord, you know what we need. And Lord, we know that there's no greater need than to experience cleansing of sin. There's no greater need than to have hope and assurance that our life matters. And so, Lord, again, I pray that you would speak to each and every heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 5, we read, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For your father knows the things you have need of. Before you ask them. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus speaks about true righteousness. He has introduced us to the citizens or the people in this kingdom and the principles in this kingdom and the precepts in this kingdom. Jesus has addressed the issue of giving in verses 1 through 4. And now he's going to speak to the issue of prayer in verses 5 through 15. Jesus will speak about the spirit of prayer in verses 5 through 8. And then he will speak about the substance and sincerity of prayer in verses 9 through 15. And later, later Jesus will speak about fasting in verses 9 through 15. What is prayer? It may seem like an odd question, but the simple answer is prayer is conversation with God. Some equate meditation with prayer. For some, self-talk is prayer. In movies, books, and popular media, prayer is often portrayed as that last-ditch effort, that final hope, the ultimate appeal to the big man in the sky when everything else has failed. According to Barna Research Associates, 86% of Americans believe that God hears prayers and has the power to answer them. Years ago, the president of the Baptist Convention got into trouble for telling the world that even though God hears all prayer, he's under no obligation to answer anyone's prayer who's not a Christian. Does God hear the prayers of unbelievers? The reoccurring testimony 
in the scripture is that God from time to time for reasons that we don't always understand will sometimes respond to the prayers of unbelievers but God clearly is under no obligation to respond to an unbeliever's prayer. Why do you suppose that is? The Bible says that sin separates us from God. If prayer is speaking to God, then it would seem to me that prayer becomes the necessity of individuals who have a right relationship with God, who have, who have experienced grace and mercy and hope and forgiveness. Prayer is more than speaking to God. Prayer is a way of life, not simply the emergency communications in times of distress. Prayer is about having a relationship with God. And prayer is not just simply psychological self-fulfillment or trying to manipulate God. Someone once asked me, look, why should I pray to God? Why should I pray since God knows exactly what's going to happen? And since God is going to do exactly what he wants to do, why should I even pray? And I think that the right answer is, it is true that God is sovereign. It is true that God cannot be persuaded or dissuaded from doing exactly what he wants to do. It is true that God knows exactly what you need and exactly what you want. But it is also true that prayer is more than you simply asking for to asking God for something that you need, but it becomes the basis, the mechanism of friendship and fellowship and relationship with God. We pray according to the Bible because the Bible tells us to pray in Ephesians 6, 18. It says praying always. Colossians 4, 2. Paul says continue in prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray without ceasing. Romans 12, 12. Continue in steadfast prayer. With so many admonitions to pray, you would think that, of course, we pray. Nothing lies beyond the reach of prayer except that which lies beyond the will of God. I heard the story of an atheist who owned a brewery. And a local church prayed earnestly that God would somehow do away with the brewery. And one day the brewery was struck by lightning and it burned to the ground. And the atheists sued the church. <laughs> but the church denied all responsibility. The judge says, this is the strangest case I've ever encountered. An atheist who believes in answered prayer in a church that takes no responsibility for prayer. <laughs> we pray for guidance, for provision, for protection, for mercy, for grace, forgiveness. Sometimes we pray because we have a real relationship and friendship with God, the God of the universe. Jesus will give us the true meaning and purpose of prayer, and he does this again by contrasting true and false righteousness. We pray because we have a relationship with God. We pray individually and privately in verses 5 through 6. Does that mean that, that the Bible condemns corporate prayer or public prayer? No, Jesus is simply reminding us that people who do not pray in private probably should avoid praying in public. But look what it says in verse 5. He says, prayer should be without hypocrisy. Look what it says, and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Jesus says, note for yourself, and when you pray, not if you pray, there's an expectation of prayer. The word itself seems to be more than just the initiation of a simple conversation. 
It has something to do with a rigorous outpouring of what's on the inside to God. Adam Clark in his commentary writes, quote, A proper idea of prayer is a pouring out of the soul unto God as a free will offering, solemnly and eternally dedicated to him, accompanied with the most earnest desire that it may know him, love him, serve him. So prayer that is absent, the knowledge of him, the love for him, service to him is probably deficient prayer. Not all prayers rise to that noble definition. The Lord Jesus again makes it clear that it's a sin to pray in order to be seen and heard by others. You see here at this point in our passage and in our study, the concern that Jesus seems to have isn't that we pray, but how we pray. Jesus believes that not all prayers are equal or honorable, that it's possible to pray with the wrong motive and in the wrong way. Now, I want you to think about that, and I want you to connect the dots of what we've learned. Remember, I asked you the last time we met, what do you believe about giving? And what does Jesus believe about giving? It seems to me that we could just as easily ask the question, what do you believe about praying? And what does Jesus believe about praying? You see, you may have grown up in a world where all prayers were equal and that God had some sort of holy obligation to respond to each and every prayer in each and every way, but the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that prayer can be hypocritical in verse 5, superficial in verse 7, self-serving in verse 8, even self-deceptive. A person can think that they're being heard because of much speaking or with a false idea that they can persuade God or convince God that God needs to do something simply based on that person's perception in verses 7 and 8. So what do the hypocrites do according to Jesus? They position themselves in public places. In this case, it's synagogues. And street corners so that other people will be impressed with their religious piety. Again, motive matters. And here, motive in prayer and for prayer from a hypocritical standpoint appears to be to be seen by others. If the love for public perception and public prominence is what drives the prayer, then Jesus says you have your reward. The Pharisees designated, by the way, three times during the day to pray. They would pray the third hour. They would pray the sixth hour. They would pray the ninth hour. This sort of translates roughly to nine o'clock in the morning, 12 o'clock noon, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The people would gather at the temple or they would gather at the synagogue or they would stop wherever they were and they would pray. If you've ever been in a Muslim country like Egypt or Syria or Iran or Iraq, when the call to prayer comes, sometimes you can see people roll out the carpet And they'll get down and no matter what they were doing, that's when they will pray. Jesus, by the way, isn't opposed to standing or kneeling or sitting. He's not even opposed to standing in the synagogues to pray. It's the posture of the heart that Jesus cares about. Not the posture of the body. The posture of the body will sometimes reveal the posture of the heart. In the Bible, we find people praying with their face down in Numbers 16, 22. In Joshua 5, 14, people kneel in 2 Chronicles 6, 13 and in Luke 22, 41. Sometimes people sit, 2 Samuel 17, or 7, 8. So whether you're standing, sitting, kneeling, none of that seems to matter. John Bunyan would say, In prayer, it is better to have a heart without words than words without heart. 
So it, is, it isn't just simply the position of prayer, but it's the posture and the place of the heart in prayer. And if your motive is to be seen by others, according to Jesus, you have your reward. If your motive is to fulfill your religious duty or your religious obligation, you have your reward. You might think, or we might think of the expression, look, when Jesus says, they have their reward. The expression is a first century expression which meant paid in full and that you should have no expectation of further remuneration. In other words, you've been given everything that you have coming to you. So Jesus invites us to examine our motives. Do we sometimes say things or do things or pray things to impress others? You know, someone might say, well, you know, God woke me up at three o'clock in the morning with a very specific word of knowledge just for you. Or this morning while I was praying at five o'clock, laboring as I always do in prayer, you came to my mind. Is it possible that people do get up at three o'clock and pray? Of course. Five o'clock and pray? Of course. Does God sometimes speak to people? Of course. But why are you saying this? Why are you saying what you're saying? What is it that you really are trying to accomplish? Are you trying to impress someone with your spiritual discipline? You know, years ago, there was a TV scam evangelist, and maybe some of you saw it. He was being investigated by a television journalist. And in the TV scam, you could see this so-called evangelist and he was lying prostrate on what, what looked like a sea of mail. And he was allegedly crying over this mail. You could see what looked like makeup streaks down his face. And they went in the back of his so-called prayer center and they found a dumpster filled with thousands and thousands and thousands of prayer requests. The envelopes had been opened to find checks and to find cash and to find money orders. But then all of the prayer requests were thrown into the dumpster. This guy didn't care about praying. He cared about getting stuff from people. What Jesus is saying is don't play games. Just like giving, prayer can be an activity that people engage in in order to appear spiritual. Why let people know when you pray? To prove how spiritual you are? Why bother if you let them know you might as well kiss your reward goodbye? And so Jesus is trying to once again focus on the reality that beyond the issue of giving is the issue of the heart. Beyond the issue of prayer is the issue of the heart. And so prayer should we be without hypocrisy. It should be without spectacle. Look what it says in verse six, but you, but you, when you pray, go into your room and when you've shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in the secret place will reward you openly. Prayer, in part, is secret fellowship with God. The King James translates this, when you pray, go into your closet. It literally means go into your inner room. This is how it's translated in the New American Standard. Go to your private place. We find a place that's free of interruption. We find a place that's free of distraction. The whole idea is that you go into the private place in order to communicate with God, to retreat with God. The place of prayer isn't what's sacred. It's the privacy that is sacred. The place of prayer and fellowship is one with a lock. And you can imagine, maybe you grew up in a world where you didn't have seven, eight, nine, ten rooms. 
You know, there's a story of Susanna Wesley. She was the mother of John and Charles Wesley, but she didn't just have those two boys. She had <laughs> she had 12 other children. She had a total of 14 children, and they lived in a one-room flat. But every day, mother would pray. Susanna Wesley would sit in her rocking chair, and she would cover her face with her shawl. And when she covered her face with her shawl, all of the children knew that mother was communicating with God. Sometimes our family and friends may know that we're praying, but they don't need to know what we're praying. And in verses 5 and 7, it says, when you pray, that's plural. Verse 5, when you pray. Verse 7, when you pray. But here in verse 6, it's singular. But you, you singular, when you pray. The emphasis on, is on privacy and intimacy, private communication with God. And so the key to answered prayer is secrecy, privacy, intimacy. If our real motive is intimacy and fellowship and proximity, we have our answer. So when Jesus says, but you, but you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you've shut the door, you pray to your father. And that's interesting in and of itself. Because later on when we see the so-called Lord's Prayer, and he begins that prayer with our father, remember he's now communicating that this is your father. He's talking about relationship and fellowship and intimacy. Many of you know that I'm a big fan of history and Roman culture, and I was reading one of the, um, a, a Roman historian, and he was telling a story about a triumph for Caesar. And as, as uh, the triumph was going through the streets of Rome, there was one little boy who made his way past the guard, and the guard picked him up, and he says, that's the emperor. You can't do that. And the little boy said, he may be your emperor, but he is my father. You can imagine what the soldier did, put the kid down. <laughs> Our heavenly father is the creator of the universe. He is the sovereign emperor of all existence, but he's your father. That's the idea, the real motive, intimacy, friendship, fellowship, proximity, nearness to God. Again, I think it's reading too much into the text to forbid or discourage corporate prayer or public prayer. We know that that's true because the early church met together for corporate prayer prayer in Acts chapter 2 verse 42. They met together and prayed together in chapter 12 verse 12, chapter 13 verse 3, chapter 14 verse 23, chapter 20 verse 36. If you go back to the Old Testament book of Daniel, you'll remember that when Daniel, when there was a prohibition against prayer, Daniel did what Daniel did Every single day, he opened his windows towards the, the west, towards Jerusalem, and he prayed three times a day. And so we know that Jesus prayed privately. In Mark chapter 1, verse 25, it says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went and departed to a solitary place. The Bible says, And there he prayed. Elisha prayed privately in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 32. Much of our prayer life is secret, top secret. And I love this expression. Your father who sees in secret. Part of the meaning is that God sees your heart. Part of the meaning seems to be also that no matter what you tell God, it remains a secret. Have you ever said something to someone, hey, I need to have your confidence. I need to make sure that this is just between you and me. And then they go, well, 
I guess I need to tell this person and I need to tell that person and I need to tell this person and I need to tell that person. And you, you'll notice something that when you are speaking with your father in heaven and you, and you say, God, can you keep a secret? Much of what we say is for his eyes only and his, his ears only. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, God will never betray a secret. It's not simply our words, but the condition of our heart that God's concerned about. And so when God is the source of our affection and the object of our fellowship, he's also the object of our reward, his answers to our prayers. He answers our prayer. Now think about where Jesus is going with this. He answers our prayers with his presence. Your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. One of his open rewards is that he will in fact answer your prayers. The problem it may not be the answer you want, but he will answer your prayer. His answer is always either yes or no or wait. Did you grow up in a world where you ask your parents something and they said maybe, but maybe was always a euphemism for no? It was their way to bring you to the bitter realization that you weren't going to get what you had hoped that you were going to get. But God will say yes. God will say no. God will say, wait. And so look what it says in verse 7. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they, sh they think that they'll be heard with their many words. And so Jesus says, we are different. We avoid repetition. We employ earnestness and specificity. So when Jesus says, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions. Those three words, use, vain, repetitions, is all one great, big, long Greek word. Like most Greek words, it has a prefix, a root word, and a suffix. And when you put this big, long conglomerate together, the word itself meant to speak without thinking. It comes from a root word, which means to babble on and on and on. So vain repetitions are stock sentences. Vain repetitions are empty phrases. We all grew up with them. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I die, what? What? I'm going to die. <laughs> Can you imagine how frightening it is to tell a child, okay, just simply pray this prayer. And if I die before I wake, is, is there something I need to know, mom? <laughs> no, no, no. It's just sort of a catch-all general way of saying, Okay, one day you will die. But it shouldn't be for years and years and years from now. What is Jesus saying? What does secret prayer do? It reveals the intent of the heart. Now Jesus will address a different issue. It's not just simply the intent of the heart, but the content of the prayer. I love what D.A. Carson says and how he translates this verse. He says, quote, And when you pray, do not keep babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Carson suggests that the point that Jesus is making is, Quote, his disciples should avoid meaningless, repetitive prayers offered under the misconception that mere length will make prayers efficacious. Essentially, it's thorough.
purely pagan, for pagan gods allegedly thrive on incantation and repetition, but the personal father God to whom believers pray does not require information about our needs, unquote. In ancient as well as modern religious movements, people have been led to believe that more is better. The more you pray, the more you chant, the more you sing, the more you recite, the more likely the gods will hear what you have to say. And Jesus says, this is not true. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus points out three common errors that people make concerning prayer. Number one, praying to be heard by others, verses five and six. Number two, praying mere words, formula, ritual, empty incantation and repetition, verse seven. And number three, later Jesus is gonna warn about prayers when sin is inside of your heart in verses 14 and 15. So Jesus is going to later warn and say, the condition of your heart matters. The content of your prayer matters. The condition in both heart and mind matter. So here the heathen are the Gentiles. So what's Christ's criticism? Whenever you read... Do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do read Gentile. What does Jesus mean? He means that other people groups pervert prayer by seeking to gain favor from God through superstitious practices. Pause. Were the Jews guilty sometimes of perverting prayer by seeking to gain favor from God through superstitious practices? Yes. So this isn't an indictment against all Gentiles simply at the, at the, at the, for the purpose of redeeming the Jews. Jews and Gentiles had one thing in common. They were both capable of perverting prayer by seeking to gain favor through superstitious practices. By the way, can Christians be guilty of this exact same thing? I think that the answer is yes. And see, you, you have family members and friends and, and people that you go to work with or you go to school with, you live with them day in and day out. And the subject of prayer comes up. Okay, this is one time when I can see a show of hands. How many of you know at least one unsaved person? Just one. Just one unsaved person. Most of you raise your hand. How many of you who raise your hand who know at least one saved person have an unsaved person that they know who prays? Yeah, I do. Unsaved people pray all the time. Buddhists pray, Muslims pray, our unsaved atheist, agnostic friends, even they pray. John Corson writes, quote, Buddhists today still utilize prayer wheels, little pinwheels upon which they pin prayers, believing that the wind carries their prayers to heaven. Each time a breeze makes the wheel spin. In the Middle Ages, Buddhist monks came in contact with Spanish priests who in turn adopted the prayer wheel into something that we recognize today as the rosary. Unquote. Does constant repetition impress God? No. Does constant repetition mean meaningful and purposeful prayer? No. Not according to Jesus. In this passage, Jesus suggests that there are people who think they will be heard for their many words, as if the amount of prayer results in answered prayer. Jesus says that not everyone who prays can expect an answer or at least the answer they're looking for. Imagine a person will pray, Lord, forgive me. 
I now forgive everyone who's ever hurt me or has ever done anything wrong to me, who's, who's ever done some wicked, evil thing to me. Is it a commendable thing to provide blanket forgiveness for all injury and all wrong ever done to you? You might think it is. Does this act mean that now God has a responsibility to forgive you because you've forgiven other people? No. God doesn't simply forgive people on the basis of the presence or the absence of forgiveness in your life. We are forgiven on the basis of what Jesus has done for us. This is why we talk about the gospel so much. This is why we, we say, look, you get to go to God on the basis of what Jesus has done, based on his grace, based on his sacrifice, based on what Jesus has done. You, you see, the Bible says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. But this isn't a magic formula to wipe the, clay, the slate clean. Here, confession means I agree with God about my problem of sin. I agree with God about God's solution to the problem of sin. And God's solution to the problem of sin is the gospel. When it says, I agree with God, that means you say the same thing that God says about your condition. Does the Bible prohibit stubborn, persistent prayer? No. What's the difference between repetition and stubborn, persistent, prevailing prayer? One consists of a vain repetition because of an emptiness of heart. And the other one is a commitment to press forward in times of need. Does Jesus pray three times in the garden of Gethsemane? Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Does Paul pray three times? Take this sorrowful thing, this injurious thing that's happening in my life. Take it away. Yes. And you'll remember that God's answer to Jesus is, I know that pain and suffering is going to be a part of your future, but there's rhyme and reason to what I'm doing. Paul, there's pain and suffering as a part of your future, but there's rhyme and reason to what I'm doing. Persistent prevailing prayer is different. God isn't like your husband, ladies, where if you just nag him long enough, okay, whatever you want, it's yours, just have it. Just please, 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 don't ask me again. Or children, God isn't like your parents. If I nag them, if I wake up in the morning, if I beg them, if I beg them in the morning, if I beg them at noon, if I beg them at night, pretty soon I'm going to wear them down. I'm going to, I'm going to beat them like a drum. I'm going to wear them down so that, so that eventually they'll give in. God isn't like your mom and dad. God isn't like that. But there are times when we labor in prayer and prayer is hardest when it's hardest to pray. John MacArthur writes, quote, it is not honest, properly motivated repetition of needs or praise before God that is wrong, but the mindless, indifferent recital of spiritual sounding incantations like magical formulas over and over. Not only must our hearts be right before God will hear our prayer, but also our minds. Thoughtless prayer is almost as offensive to God as heartless prayer. In most instances, they go together, unquote. Heartless prayer, offensive to God. Thoughtless prayer, offensive to God. Selfish prayer, offensive to God. And so look what it says in verse 8. Prayer without fear. Therefore, do not be like them. For your father knows the things that you have need of before you ask them. So how then do we pray? Let's review. 
we trust him. In humility, we depend upon him. Absent fear, therefore do not be like them, for your father knows the things that you have need of. Our heavenly father is omniscient. That means he knows everything. He's omnipotent, which means that he has all power. The contrast is between the Bible's view of God and the heathen's view of God. The heathen view of God is he doesn't really care or he can give in through guilt and manipulation that you can trick God into doing something that you want God to do. What kind of God is God? And for many people in the world, God is an endless fountain of blessings, a well, a storehouse who helps you create your own reality. To others, God is a tyrant who has to be pacified. So what kind of God is God? No, the real God, the real God, the real God in heaven knows the truth about you and your heart and your circumstances. And your heavenly father knows what you need. Think about that statement just for a moment. Because you might read that statement and think, what is it that I need? Do I need a place to stay? Do I need food to eat? Do I need love and companionship? Friendship and fellowship. What is it that I need? Do I, do I need a job? Do I, do I need people to not hurt me? What is it that I need? And what if you discovered that your greatest need, your greatest need is to have your conscience cleansed? What if your greatest need, what if your greatest need is to know that there's a God who loves you and cares about you and is willing to cleanse you and wash you? What if your greatest need is assurance? What if your greatest need is you need to know whether or not God is telling the truth about Jesus? What is your greatest need? What is your greatest need? We acknowledge our need and dependence to the best of our ability. And that's what serves as the basis for communication with God. Because he loves you. He cares about you. He knows what you need. Martin Luther said, by our praying, we are instructing ourselves before him, unquote. Some people mistakenly believe that the purpose of prayer is to inform God or persuade God. But we don't have to beg God. The Lord wants us to ask for bread and expect to receive it. The Lord wants us to ask for forgiveness and expect to receive it. The Lord wants us in humility and dependence to cry out to him. Prayer in part is an opportunity for God to demonstrate that love, to demonstrate that power, to demonstrate that he cares. Does God answer prayer? And of course, the answer is yes. He always answers. Like I said earlier, and the answer is always yes or no or wait. R.A. Tory was right. When he said, the chief purpose of prayer is that God may be glorified in the answer. You see, we sometimes forget that when the answer is yes, it's so that God can be glorified. That when the answer is no, it's so that God can be glorified. When the answer is wait, it's so that God can be glorified. I read the story of a couple of girls who were walking to school one morning when suddenly it dawned on them that unless they hurried really quickly, they were going to be late. And one of them said, hey, let's stop and pray that we won't be tardy. And the other one said, no, let's pray and run as fast as we can. I think that there's a realistic prayer 
and there's an unrealistic prayer. You may not like the answers that God gives, but his answers are always wiser than your prayers. George MacDonald wrote, quote, there is a communion with God that asks for nothing, yet asks for everything. He who seeks the Father more than anything he can give is likely to have what he asks for. He is not, li if he, he is not likely to ask amiss. And this becomes an important part because the truth is the Bible says that you can ask with wrong motives, with wrong understanding. When are we likely to ask amiss? When we fail to confess our sin in Psalm 68, 18. When we ask in unbelief in James chapter 1, verse 5. When we ask insincerely in Matthew 6, 5. When we ask with carnal motivations in James chapter 4, verse 3. He says, you ask, but you don't have because you ask in order to burn it on your own lusts. When there's problems in the home, 1 Peter 3, 7, 7 says it hinders our prayer. Pride hinders our prayer in Luke 18, 10. When we refuse to submit to biblical teaching in Proverbs 1, 24. When we refuse to forgive or be forgiven in Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24, which we've already read. So do you pray? Are you a stranger to prayer? Or have you prayed and you haven't gotten exactly what you wanted? The agnostic H.G. Wells became angry when he prayed and he didn't get what he wanted while taking an accounting exam for which he wasn't prepared. He wasn't prepared for this test and he desperately needed to pass the test. And so he pleaded with God to balance his books. And when the figures didn't add up properly, he said, all right, Mr. God, you don't, you'll never catch me praying ever again. And he never did. And he never did. And maybe you've been in a situation where you did exactly the same thing. Unless you give me what I want, I'm never, ever going to ask ever again. And it never even occurred to you, even for a single moment, that there may be more to life than what you think you need. So how do we pray? We pray in sincerity in verse 5. We pray in privacy in verse 6. We pray in simplicity in verse 7. We pray in humility and dependence in verse 8. And clearly the scriptures give us permission to be bold in our prayers in 1 John 5, 13. Persistent in our prayers in Luke 18. Specific in our prayers in Psalm 27, verse 4. And that we pray in accordance with God's will in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. We pray because we know it's in God's best interest and in the kingdom's best interest. Fanny, Fanny Crosby was a, uh, a blind hymn writer. She's most famous for so many of her lovely hymns. But she wrote a poem which was discovered by Donald Hustad. And he decided to share it with the world. And I'm going to share it with you. She writes, God does not give me all I ask, nor answer as I pray. But oh, my cup is brimming o'er with blessings day by day. How oft the joy I thought withheld delights my longing eyes. And so I thank him from my heart for what his love denies. Sometimes I miss a treasured link in friendship's hollowed chain. And yet his smile is my reward for every throb of pain. I look beyond where purer joys delight my longing eyes. And so I thank him from my heart for what his love denies. How tenderly he leadeth me when earthly hopes are dim. And when I falter by the way, he bids me lean on him. How he lifts my soul above the clouds where friendship never dies. And so I thank him from my heart for what his love denies. You may have learned to rejoice 
when God says yes. But you still struggle with when he says no. But when God says no, there's always a reason. He never does things without rhyme and without reason. The prayer he will always answer, without exception. Jesus himself said, come to me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus says, come to me, come to me, receive from me. He's willing to love you. The answer is always yes. The answer is always yes when, if I will turn from my sin and I'll turn to you, will you receive me? The answer is always yes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we look at our hearts and, and we look at our lives and we begin to examine what we believe about prayer, Lord, we come to grips with the fact that sometimes what we believe about prayer isn't what you believe about prayer. And so, Lord, we want to pray in sincerity and we want to pray in privacy and simplicity and humility and dependence. We want to be persistent and specific in our prayers. Lord, we want to pray in such a way that we know that you'll hear our prayers. And so, Father, again, like the psalmist said so long ago, we pray that you would search us that you would know our hearts, that you would try us, and know our souls, that you'd see if there's any wicked way in us, and that you would lead us in the way everlasting. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.